Hey everyone, my name is Tegan and welcome back to Sandy Writes. I've been reflecting on what I read last year and I want to spend a little more time talking about my favourite reads of the year and collect those thoughts in one place. I think I did a video version of this in 2022 for what I believe to be the best books of the year so far, but since then I've accepted that some of the books I love to read may not be necessarily the best of books. There will also be a few repeats as I did a post midway through the year of my favourite reads of the year so far. This list would be in no particular order, just vaguely chronological, so let's begin. First up is Darling by Kay Ankrum. Kay Ankrum is truly a once in a lifetime author to me. Her prose and craft are so unique and endearing, and every book by her feels like something that has done irreversible damage to my brain chemistry. This one is a modern day thriller reimagining of Peter Pan with a very diverse cast in terms of race, sexuality, and disabilities, and is potentially the best and most enthralling Peter Pan reimagining that I've read so far. Every single book by this author is a love letter to friendships and found families. But this book also explores the importance of safety and how hard it can be to recognise abuse, especially when it can be disguised as kindness when you are longing to find a place to belong. It was an uncomfortable and a thrilling read, but I was still completely swept away alongside Wendy. Next is Young Mungo by Douglas Stewart. This is the book that I first picked up because it's comparisons to A Little Life in the sense that it's a story about suffering and dangerous loves and queerness. This didn't emotionally wreck me like Little Life did, which left me feeling completely numb. This story left me feeling angry and provoked instead. I really enjoyed the structure of the book and how well Douglas navigates between two time frames, a backstory weaved amongst a presence in the lock, and how they came together for a final chapter that is nothing less than devastating, but with a hint of hope. I am not ashamed to admit that I was on the verge of tears for many of the later chapters. This is undoubtedly a very raw story, one that is equal parts captivating and horrific, but I think it would take a certain reader to see that kind of brutal honesty and value it. These Violent Delights by Mika Nemerova is a book that I've been secondhand obsessing over through Paper Fury for a year or two, so it was nice to finally experience the obsession firsthand. This is a story of obsession, violence, intellect, passion, and cruelty, and it consumed me entirely. I finished reading it months ago and still don't have the words for a review. It's a slow, intoxicating book of violence and the mental illness, and subtle cruelty and consuming obsessive love. It's a mess, and it's so beautifully written, and I am perpetually devastated that this author doesn't have any other books released at the moment. The prose is incredible. The absolutely phenomenal level of detail just made each scene alive. It made the book slow and thoughtful, but in the best way. You aren't just viewing the world like the character would, you are so deep in his mind. The way his sensory overload seeps through the pages, I felt every word of it. Green Glass House by Kate Mulford was an unsurprising favourite. There was never any question in my mind that this would be one of my favourite middle grade books of all time. It's not that the book is atmospheric, it is and strongly so, and it's not that the characters are immediately and intensely engaging, they are and without stretching or warping. And it's not the flirtation with archetype, pastiche and homage in the setup with smugglers, customer agents and the company town, though it does a fantastic job of both presenting them and reining them into a story that you can lose yourself in. The power of this book is Milo. Behind all the clues and ghost stories and thefts and lies, Wilt Greengar's house really is a story of a hero's journey. Milo starts out as a soft-spoken kid with little faith in his own abilities. Donning the mantle of a Dungeons & Dragons type character, he taps into a strength that he might otherwise not have even known he had. Milo's slow awakening to his own strengths and abilities is the heart of the novel. For all that people will discuss the mystery and the clues, it's Milo that holds everything together. It is no surprise that A Spirit Bears Its Teeth was a favourite of the year, as Hell Followed With Us was the only thing I could think about for days after I finished reading it. This is a book about misogyny, transphobia and ableism from the perspective of an autistic transgender boy. It has a thematic focus on the violent enforcement of gender roles and Victorian era psychiatry as tools of repression. The book means more to me than I can articulate, but be aware that it is not a fun or easy read. To see a trans main character with a brain like mine who gets overwhelmed and cries and apologises over and over, who doesn't really get people or what they try to say, who moves through the world in a way so similar to the way I do, is something that I'm going to hold close. To read a book so darkly horrific, so brutally brilliant, and to point at the main character and go, hey, that's me? To deeply understand their reactions and actions is so incredibly special and rare to find. This is How You Lose the Time War is a book that I've had on my radar for a few years, but I will admit that it going viral on Twitter is what I finally convinced me to bump it to the top of my TBR. 
This is the book that you need to read if you ever need a reason to believe in love again. I adore every line in this book, it feels like a love letter to language, and there were so many paragraphs that demanded I read them ten times before moving on. If I was someone who annotated books, every page would have pen all over it. This is a sapphic love story and a tale of self-discovery set against a backdrop of multiverse wars and time travel and limitless time and space. The story is told largely through letters the characters leave behind for each other on various battlefields as they chase each other across the universe. This book is small, only 200 pages or so, but it's full of so much life and love that I don't really know how to summarise it in a way that does it any amount of justice. All Wives Under the Sea is another book that I've had on my radar for a while, and I think I added to my TBR during the depths of my deep sea horror influence fascination. This is another sapphic love story, this time set against the backdrop of a slow burn retelling of horror's experience deep beneath the ocean, woven amongst the events that occurred when she returned. The author depicts a loving queer relationship that shows a realistic perspective of being a woman in a patriarchal world, and the focus of the relationship is the unity of their love and their thriving as a couple, rather than battling against society. For once, the horrors are not homophobia. Loss and grief are key themes in this book, showing the loss of a loved one who is slowly slipping away from you, juxtaposed with the loss of a parent to a degenerative disease. There's this motif of degeneration throughout, which hit me a little as someone with a chronic illness, largely shown through Leah's state as she returns from the ocean, but also shown through droplets throughout, such as Miri's friend with declining eyesight. Loss is inevitable, coping is a necessity, and grief is infectious. What the River Knows is a book I originally read because I fell in love with the cover on NetGalley, read an advanced ebook coffee, and then I fell in love with the book itself, and then I received my Owl Crate Special Edition and fell in love all over again. It's beautiful. This book is a captivating mosaic of ancient Egyptian history, a vibrant setting, an immersive plot, and an array of characters with questionable motives who are still engaging and likeable. I did not know this book was the first in the series when I picked it up, and I'm already looking forward to whatever else the stories have to offer. The writing is beautiful, especially the descriptions of the Cairo markets, the journey up the Nile, and the experience on the archaeological dig site. The blend of cultures was also incredibly engaging. I love the representation of the various family dynamics, how different religions and languages were dropped in throughout, and how authentic these representations felt. This book is truly a love letter to the history of Egypt and its mythology. What Lies in the Woods was a favourite from later in the year, and I should have expected it as I read Rules of Vanishing in 2022 and I fell in love on the first page. This book is completely different, but I fell in love from the start just the same. It's chilling and atmospheric and suspenseful. Naomi is a great protagonist, she is immensely flawed and doesn't make smart choices, but she is resilient and survivor of the violence she's endured, even if she is scarred by it. The story is full of twists and red herrings, and one of the twists is not difficult to predict, but I think that's a sign of a well-laid-out foundation to the story rather than a flaw. One of my favourite parts of the book was the descriptions of the goddess game, the game they spent the summer playing in the woods. There's something about weird little girls pretending that they're deities and worshipping a skeleton with offerings that just sit right with me. Maybe because I was also a weird little girl who thought I was magical, it's the childlike wonder and the whimsy and the warmth and the nostalgia, directly contrasted with the events that end the summer which speaks to me so deeply. And those are my favourite reads of 2023. If you've read any of those or have them on your TBR, let me know in the comments below. Please tell me what your favourite books of the year were and... I look forward to another another long year of reading. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope to see you next time. Bye.